If you clicked on this episode, then you may have noticed the title, "The Tragedy of Tina Fontaine." Usually, when I think of tragedy, and this may be because I spent way too much time getting my master's in English that I never use, I think of the Great Tragedy, which is the fall of a hero due to his or her own tragic flaw. But the thing is, with Tina's story, the tragedy is instead bought on. By our society. Before we dive into Tina's story, I want to recite this quote from Toni Morrison in her book *The Bluest Eye* because it explains what I mean more eloquently. A little examination and much less melancholy would have proved to us that our seeds were not the only ones that did not sprout. Nobody's did. What is clear now is that of all of that hope. Fear, lust, love, and grief. Nothing remains but picola in the unyielding earth. When I tell you the story of Tina Fontaine, I want you to think about how a child's environment shapes their future, and how sometimes the environment has predetermined factors—racism, classism, etc.—that will greatly set people of color at a greater disadvantage. So grab your vice of choice. I'll be knitting, and join me as we explore the case of Tina Fontaine. My name is Sophia Talley, and this is True Crime in Knit. Tina's father, Eugene Fontaine of Sexking First Nation, was a survivor of the Canadian Indian residential school system. The school system committed cultural genocide by depriving students of their culture and instead exposed them to physical and sexual abuse. The point of these schools were to replace native culture with English language and Christianity. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because this began in 1876, but it only ended in 1996, only a few years before Tina Fontaine's birth. So. At the age of twelve, her father Eugene was actually enrolled in this school system, but he ran away, and he soon became addicted to alcohol—a battle that he will face for the rest of his life. At the age of ten, Fontaine's mother, a Bloodvine First Nations, Valentina Duck, was taken from her family by the state. At the time, she lived with her mother and grandmother. The latter, which would often date a violent abuser who was addicted to drugs and alcohol, after that she moved around repeatedly. She began to be sexually exploited by adults and started to use alcohol and drugs. The Manitoba advocate for children and youth says that little was done to protect her. So when Tina's parents met, her mother was only twelve, and her father was twenty-three. Child and Family Services knew that their relationship was sexual and knew that Fontaine's father had a past that involved violence and severe addictions. They also knew that Tina's father was harboring a minor in the system illegally. Files noted that her mother would frequently run away from her foster placements to stay with Fontaine's father. In 1994, at the age of 12, Fontaine's mother was reported as feeling depressed, suicidal, isolated, alone, and unloved. And she was only 12, and already it almost feels as if she's living the life of a grown woman. This is not okay. In the spring of 1996, at the age of 14, Fontaine's mother gave birth to her first child, who was immediately taken from her by child services and placed in foster care because of her age, history of running away, and drug uses. There is evidence that Tina's father was pimping her out at the same time throughout her pregnancy. Tina Fontaine was born on January first, nineteen ninety-nine. She was Valentina's second child, and in June two thousand, her mother gave birth to a third baby. So, they were 
only months apart. Tina's mom was only 17 at this time and still in the system while her father was 28. What I don't understand is that Tina's mother is still a minor and she is in the system. They call it CFS, which is Child Family Services, and it's really similar to our CPS here in the States because I don't know if I mentioned this is all taking place in Canada. But the weird thing is, is that she's in custody of the state and they are not taking steps to protect her from her husband, who is a child predator. At this time, Tina's parents were actually taking steps to improve their life by joining community support groups for addiction. They were even trying to complete their family by reuniting with their first child. This is a normal request, right? Well, unfortunately, the CFS agency involved did not even try. Despite the effort, both parents could not beat their addictions. When Tina was only a one-year-old, she and her younger sibling, who was only four months at the time, was removed from her family's care for the first time by Child and Family Services. This was a result of her parents leaving the two children with Tina's mother, and her parents just never returned for them. They just left them there. Though Valentina was able to reclaim her children four days later, there was never any official investigation or even safety checks done by CFS. Only one year later, Tina was taken again by the system after a concerned neighbor made a call about Valentina and Eugene caring for their children while being very intoxicated. They were so intoxicated that they were walking in the middle of a street, an active street with cars with one of their children in tow. We don't know which one. Eventually, there was enough disturbances in the home that both of the children were put in foster care by 2001. This seems to have been the last straw for Valentina and Eugene's relationship as they separated shortly after. In late 2001, Eugene once again was able to get custody of his children back. And despite Eugene's sketchy past of allegedly pimping out his wife while she was still a child herself, his past of drug abuse and alcoholism, he tried really hard to give his two children a good life. He would bring them to a local family center every morning so that way the women there can help him get the children ready for the day. They would braid Tina's hair for him and try to give them the stability that children needed. You know, we may never know for certain what was happening in their household, but everyone who worked at this center and knew the family felt as if Eugene was trying, genuinely trying to do better. As part of his effort, he decided to ask his aunt to help co-parent them. This is because starting in 2002, Valentina had started a new life with a new partner and welcomed two new children into this world by 2003. At this time, she was no longer trying to get custody of her children. It almost feels as if she was just trying to start over, which is just very sad. Unfortunately, in 2004, Eugene had relapsed in sobriety and actually received a cancer diagnosis. So five-year-old Tina and her sibling were sent to live with her great aunt for good. She was so close to this great aunt who cared for her off and on throughout her life that she referred to her as grandmother and as her great uncle as grandpa. So I will refer to them as such just for simplicity and just to honor her. Tina's grandmother did not have full custody of the children, but as Eugene's behavior became more erratic and violent, she began to see herself as the main caregiver. There were times in which Eugene would just show up at their home drunk and beaten as if he had been fighting, screaming for his aunt to give his children back. As his diagnosis worsened to stage three cancer, he became too weak to be a threat to the family. And her grandmother actually felt safer when Eugene was pretty much on his deathbed. His mood became milder and less erratic, possibly because he was just sick. And at this time, they would just eat Sunday dinner together as a family. Tina was finally able to have the happy life that she deserved with her grandparents and with these safer visits with her father. In 2011, when Tina was only 12, she was dealt another terrible blow. Her father had been out drinking with 
two other men, and they began to argue over money, which then escalated into a physical fight, ending with Eugene being beaten to death. The two men pleaded guilty to manslaughter, but they only got nine years in jail. Eugene wasn't a perfect father, but Tina was very close to him. It's possible that she felt this way because he was the parent who fought for her the most. On the day of the funeral, Valentina called her daughter for the first time in seven years. And after this, they kept contact every week via phone calls until Valentina suddenly just stopped calling. Her number was disconnected whenever Tina would try to call her back, and she never gave Tina an alternative way to communicate with her. Once again, Tina was abandoned by her mother. With the loss of her father and her mother being emotionally and physically distant, Tina's grandmother is quoted as saying that during this time, Tina, and this is a quote, was very hurt and very lost. That's when she drifted away. Without the support of her parents, social services, and her community, Tina just began to sink into herself. She became quiet at school, stopped doing her work, and would even skip school frequently. When she was 14, she would run away. Tina's grandmother just wasn't sure of what to do. She wanted child services to help, but at the same time, she was unsure if they were able to. And despite Tina's sudden change in school, the school didn't contact child services either. Now, I want to stop here to say that you need to understand that Tina's grandmother most likely mistrusted her local child services agency. At a cutout, a lot of information because if I were to list all the times that their local CFS did not return their phone call or even follow up or even just meet them in person, we wouldn't be here at all today. There was just so many times during Tina's life in which she was just let down by the system and yet it just kept happening again and again. And the sad thing is this is all well documented in CFS files. She just slipped through the cracks and there was absolutely no excuse for that. As a result, her behavior became more and more destructive after an incident in which she self-harmed during an argument with her grandmother. She began to experiment with drugs and would talk to adult men online and disappear without a word to her family, possibly to meet these men. As a result, her grandmother began looking into alternative care for her as she felt like she was unable to keep Tina safe while she lived with her. You know, as someone who loves to care for children and who like to adopt them from the foster care system, my heart literally breaks for Tina. I just cannot imagine the hurt and pain and trauma that she dealt with and how many times she would feel let down. There were multiple incidents between Tina and CFS, but on July 17, 2014, law enforcement got involved when Tina was spotted crying for help as she was being dragged down the street by an 18-year-old man. Tina was placed in detox until she sobered up later that day and then placed in a motel room by herself by a child service agent. Yes, a child service agent left Tina, who was a high-risk 15-year-old who was just assaulted the night before by a grown man and who was dealing with addiction in a motel room by herself. They left her there. Now, this was done because they did not have anywhere else to place her. I find this situation very negligent, especially when the next day when Protective Services went to go check on her, Tina was just gone. And this was only seven years ago in which they just left a teen unattended in a hotel. My brain just cannot work out how this would have been the best idea. On the 22nd, five days later, CFS finally hears from Tina. She was at her mother's house with her 18-year-old boyfriend, the same man who assaulted her on the night of the 17th. Now, I find it interesting that they couldn't find her even though she seemed to have been at her mother's house this whole time and they couldn't find her mother who lived in the area. This part, I don't understand what happened here, but let's just move on because yikes. CFS wanted to find a placement for her, not at her mother's house because it was alleged that her mother and her 
would smoke crack together. With having few options of safe havens, Tina was placed in a youth shelter on the 23rd, where she stayed until the 26th, when she ran away again. Now, at this moment, you may realize why I decided to talk about Tina's mother's past, because had Tina's mother's past had been enriched with care and responsibility from the CFS agency, we wouldn't be here today talking about how she wasn't able to care for her child because she would smoke crack with her. This is just generations here upon generations of institutionalized racism. It's really disturbing because, again, this is only seven years ago. Like, this is not that long ago from which this podcast is now being recorded. If you're just listening and you're, you can't see my face, my face is just upset. The CFS reported Tina's missing to Winnipeg police on the 31st of July. And remember, she went missing on the 26th, so that's quite a bit of time. August 2nd, Tina called CFS from her grandmother's house, who urged her to return back to the shelter where they had a bed ready for her. Tina responded with she just wanted to find a place that felt like home. She continued to talk to CFS about potential placement until she showed up at a center early in the morning on August 8th, but she didn't stay. At 5.15 a.m., that same day, during a traffic stop, Tina was found in a vehicle with a drunk driver who was sexually exploiting her. The police did not take her into custody, as was normal protocol for a missing minor. They just let her go. At 10 a.m., she was found passed out in an alleyway naked from the waist down near Ellis Avenue and was rushed to the hospital. After being checked out at the hospital, she was discharged before being checked into yet another local motel room by CFS. So they decided to put her in the room again. And of course, from what we know about Tina from her past occurrences, which weren't that long ago, it is no surprise that she slips out of the motel room once again. We don't know much of where Tina went after leaving the motel. Her friend claims that that night, her and Tina were on Ellis Avenue, where a man approached Tina to exchange money for sex, and Tina agreed and left with him. This was the last known sighting of Tina Fontaine. The next day on August 9th, CFS reports her missing to the police. I'm gonna stop now to have a knitter mission because I need a break and I'm sure you guys do too. So for today's knitter mission, which is an intermission with knitting in front of it, so it's knitter mission, I am going to show you what I have been knitting. I have so much set up, so if you're watching, you might see my eyes dart to the left, dart to the right. You might see me move away from my mic. I shouldn't be doing that. But that is because I am a one-woman show where I'm checking monitors here, I'm checking the script there, I'm checking my camera here, and I'm checking the mic down there. So my eyes tend to dart everywhere. So I am so sorry. I cannot. So I'm working on a bikini and I've been wanting to knit a bikini for years. I absolutely love the look of knitted bikinis. I know that sounds weird, but I really wanted to start knitting them back when I was pregnant just because I wanted to have a beach uh, baby moon and I wanted a bikini that was cute but at the time I was very big for my gestation time I was huge I always measured like I was having twins because that's just how women in my family measure and so I could not find a bathing suit that was cute for someone that was huge you know like I had a big belly <laughs> so I decided to design my own unfortunately as my pregnancy progressed I started getting sicker and sicker just nauseous and amongst other normal things no complications just normal things and so I had to kind of bench this project of my bikini pattern well the bikini pattern is making a comeback. I'm working on the pattern. I'm editing it out. It's already written out. I just wanted to edit it some more and make it more accessible because it's not a normal pattern. It is actually a recipe. And I'm going to show you, if you're watching, I'm going to show you the bikini bottom now. 
Now, what I like about this bikini bottom is that there's an elastic, so it's very stretchy on the waist. And which means is that when you get in the water and then you get wet and get out the water, your bottoms are staying with you. They should not be still in the water. It's not a Thai bikini because I want it to be super flattering to all body types. In Thai bikinis, like if you have a bit of body yadi, as the youngins call it, um, they tend to cut into that body yadi and then it, it just is uncomfortable and it doesn't really look as as put together. So I really wanted it to be like a high cut bikini bottom a la Baywatch and it's very cute. And the beauty of it is that it's a recipe. So it will fit literally every human body perfectly. Um, and it's very easy to knit. I'm super excited to get this going and I'm super excited to open it up for some test knitters. I wanna see it across all bodies and genders. Yes, there will be a top to go with it that I'm still unsure how I want the top to be. I already have it written out, but you know, I'm I'm always open for changes. I really want the top to be timeless. Right now in the bikini world, a sports bra type top is very fashionable, but I also find it kind of unflattering for some people and then with the sports bra top you also want to have an elastic around your your under bust so that way it's not being lifted when you're in the water so I'm trying to think of a way to avoid the elastic up there just to make it easier to adjust I'm still trying to figure out if I want to do a sports bra type style or if I want to do a traditional triangle bikini or I'm leaning towards a combination of the two. So the support of a sports bra but still with a nice low cut V that's very flattering um, that ties in the back so that way it's also very adjustable so it's a little bit easier to wear as your body fluctuates because a lot of the time as if you're a cis woman uh, a lot of the times like your upper body your bust area tends to fluctuate uh, depending on the time of month or whatever and it can look it, it can be uncomfortable in certain swimsuits i used to live in my swimsuit up until I moved out here in the Midwest. I was a Jersey girl. I always went to the shore. I lived in string bikinis. Like I had a bikini for every day of the week. And so this bikini project like means so much to me. I'm putting so much thought into the fit and how, you know, it's easy to adjust and how it's, you know, it's actually something you get into the water with, get into the ocean or pool or hot tub with and live your life. You know, it's not just for show. I'm using special yarn too that's designed for swimsuits. Um and I'm going to put the name of that yarn in the show notes, but it's called Elise Stretch Yarn. And it is a wild ride to work with because it's really stretchy. Like the yarn itself works like a regular yarn, but then when you knit it up, it's like, it's like a stretchy swimsuit. It is glorious, but because it's a... Uh, my pattern is a recipe. You can literally use any type of DK or worsted yarn that you wish. Um, I'm just using that spandexy, stretchy material because I plan on living in this bikini as soon as I can get to a beach, okay? I will be on that beach on a lake somewhere in my bikini because I flippin' love, love the beach and the water. It's just... It just makes me so happy. So that's what I've been working on, this bikini. And if you are interested in my upcoming bikini pattern, then stay tuned because maybe by the time this show is up, you might see me prancing in it already because I need this done because I want to wear it for 4th of July, okay? We got T minus like five days to 4th of July and I'm gonna wear it. So anyway, that's enough about me and my knits. Let's get back to the tragedy of Tina Fontaine. So we left off on August 9th when CFS reported Tina missing she hadn't been seen since the day before. 
Now, this is possibly the fastest turnaround which CFS would report Tina missing from what I can see because usually they wait a few days, which to me is bananas, just literally bananas because if she was in a home like a like with her parents and if her parents notice she's missing after a day, most likely that that same day they would call the police report her missing. So you would only expect the same from CFS, but you know, at least they tried this time. But unfortunately, at 1.30 p.m. on August 17th, a body of a girl was found wrapped in plastic in a duvet blanket. It was weighed down with rocks and thrown into the Red River. The body was identified as Tina Fontaine the following day. The coroner believed she had died on or around August 10th, which is only two days from when she was left in a motel room by CFS. But because her body was in the water for so long, about a week, her death is to this day labeled as undetermined. When Tina's story was made public, the whole community was rightfully outraged. It was as if everyone just came together and thought, how could this have happened on my watch? And so the police worked to retrace Tina's steps. Their search landed them on a man named Raymond Cormier, a man that Tina often visited and whom she called Sebastian. Though no one is sure of the nature of their relationship, some sources say they were just acquaintances, but we do know that they would use drugs together. Tina would mention Sebastian to her CFS caseworkers, claiming that she liked to chill with him. Yikes. I just cannot understand why they didn't do anything about that. She even said that he offered to get her a new bike after she lost hers. The thing is, Raymond Cormier is literally every parent's nightmare. At the time, he was 52, and he had a whopping 92 convictions. He was in and out of jail his entire life. And when he wasn't in jail, he was often homeless, which, by the way, means nothing when it comes to his character. But this would become important later on in the story, so just remember that. And he was a well-known methamphetamine user. The police was able to track Raymond's and Tina's movements around the time of her death and found that they were at a house together. The police aren't revealing all of their cards as it is still an open investigation, but they soon realized that Raymond could be their man. And so they decided to set up a sting operation called Project Sticks. Somehow from June to December, 2015, they were able to get Raymond to stay in a free apartment. And get this, unbeknownst to Raymond, the whole apartment is bugged. And they even went a step further by placing an undercover officer in an apartment on the same floor. Now, this officer managed to stage 62 scenarios in hopes that Raymond would talk. In one scenario, him and a female undercover officer pretended to get into a domestic dispute. Now, Raymond is caught saying some incriminating things as well. Raymond talks to the undercover officer saying three rules of crime, deny, deny, deny. He is also being recorded telling the story of how he first met Tina. And he was telling this story to just this random woman who wasn't even part of this thing. Very odd. And he says that he was just riding his bike and Tina and a friend asked him to stop. And to Tina and her friend, he very suggestively says, there's only one reason why I'll stop. He alludes to having sex with Tina and even said that one night when her boyfriend wasn't in the area, he met with her hoping to have sex with her. He also says that the last time he saw Tina, he told her to go jump off a bridge. He would also just randomly tell people that he loved Tina and that they were in a relationship. He even got into a Facebook argument with a woman over a nude photo saying there's a little girl in A and the rest of it's quoted grave somewhere screaming at the top of her lungs for me to finish the job. And guess what? I finished the job. I don't know how this escalated to him saying something like that over a nudie photo, but man's just acting super sus right now. 
He has even caught speculating that Tina was killed because a man who was exploiting her may have found out that she was only 15. He is quoted as saying, I drew the line and that's why she got killed. And he also said, I did Tina effing supposed to be legal and only 15. I'm assuming it's supposed to be a she is effing supposed to be legal and then he finds out she's only 15. How do you feel about the language that he's using here? Because to me, it sounds as if he's is mad at a literal teenager because he sexually assaulted her and he's afraid of being charged with statutory rape. His argument sounds like it's coming from a really unstable person. There just seems to be a lot of unsettling hostility towards Tina for a reason that we just don't know. With this incriminating information, police was able to charge Raymond with second degree murder in December 2015. He decided to plead not guilty and the trial began on January 29, 2018. While the tapes were being played in court, Tina's grandmother had to leave the courtroom. And later she's quoted as saying, my God, when I heard that in the court, I just, he was infatuated with Tina, end quote. And then she also said, every time Cormier talked, he'd bring Tina up. Nobody else did but him. And the things he said about her, what he wanted to do to her, end quote. But due to the condition of Tina's body, there was no DNA or any hard evidence linking Raymond to her murder. And because her cause of death was unknown, there is no solid evidence that she was even killed. It is completely possible that she could have overdosed in someone's home and that person was scared and disposed of the body. The sad thing is, is that we just don't know and we may never know. As a result, on February 22nd, 2018, a jury found Raymond not guilty of the second degree murder of Tina Fontaine. You would think though, that after winning a murder trial, that Raymond would just lay low, but no, he continues to talk and he gives an interview to the press. He is quoted as saying that he never gave Tina crack cocaine, just weed, as if that's better. And he says, I told her because she did look young, but she also looked old enough. So it was like borderline. He is quoted as saying that. And he also says, I said, Tina, if you're old enough to be involved in an adult relationship and that's what you want with me, then I'm all good. Let's go have some fun. Yuck. It's just insane that, you know, he's just got off on murder. And he just goes on and continues to further incriminate himself. To this day, Cormier was never charged with anything in regards to Tina Fontaine's exploitation, disappearance, and death. And her file is still open, but the police are just no longer investigating. The case has now run cold. And the thing is, someone on this earth knows what happened to Tina that night. And it feels as if we're all just waiting, holding our breath and waiting for someone to finally talk. But some good came out of Tina's story. Changes were made and more stories were told. Volunteer groups and social media campaigns were bringing attention to the inequalities that led to Tina's death. We will dive into how Tina's death became a catalyst for change next week on True Crime and Knit. I am your host, Sophia Talley.